I love this space, don't you? Hi, I'm Lisa Martin. She, her. I'm on the POG board, and um, thanks for joining us here for three wonderful poets. Summer Browning, Aaron Angelo, Tony Mankus. POG would like to thank the following groups and organizations for their support. The Arizona Commission on the Arts, Poets and Writers, University of Arizona Poetry Center, University of Arizona English Department, the journal Arizona Quarterly, which is housed in the English Department, and Chax Press. Woohoo! Big thanks also to the many individual patrons and sponsors for their generous donations. And if you're interested in joining that group of sponsors, please visit our website at pogartstucson.org. If you're RSVP'd for this event, you probably got an email with a suggested donation of $5 or $3 for a student. You may have already taken care of that online. If not, perhaps at the door here. No one has ever turned away. So welcome and thanks for your support when you are able. We just began a Sabino Poets group. It's a writing in place project. And we had our third gathering in the canyon yesterday. It was great to be out there sharing writing, doing some writing, enjoying that canyon. And uh, this is a monthly gathering, so there's some little half sheets uh, at the table if you want to be on the mailing list for that and, and join us. Take one, email me, I'll get you on the mailing list. Um, speaking of land, we wish to acknowledge that being based in Tucson in the Sonoran Desert. We're on the ancestral homelands of the Hohokam and the Tohono O'odham and Pascoyaki nations. In consideration of the history of violence and dispossession, we encourage folks to reflect on how we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration I understand that the origin stories of the Otham mention their ancestors emerging in this area to be stewards of the land. So we as individuals can find ways to support that effort. And as a poetry group, we can continue to bring voices from Arizona's native nations to a wider audience through our programming. And we have, and we will. POG is committed to being an inclusive, supportive, safe space for everyone. If anything happens here tonight, today, that's making you uncomfortable, please reach out to one of our board members. There's a few of them here. You can raise your hands. Let's see. After the reading, we usually have a brief question and answer period, so I think that will happen. Hope you'll be able to stay for that. We've lost several near and dear poets lately. Charles Simic, who I mostly know through my brother, who was his friend and neighbor. Mark Weiss, who Charles and some of you probably knew. And if you're of a certain age, you can join me in a brief tribute to another poet lost to my generation this week. I'm going to sing a line, and then I invite you to sing the next line. But you've got to be a child of the 60s and the 70s, maybe. So, almost cut my hair. It happened just, happened the, other just the other day. It's getting kind of long. And our first poet, um, Ms. Sarah Browning, uh, Summer. Summer. Had the Sarah from the next reading on my head. Summer Browning is here to share her work and maybe introduce her fellow poets. Welcome.
Yeah, I'm going to introduce Tony, who's going to read first. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, luckily for me, I wrote a blurb for Tony's book, so I just have to read that, I think. Um, this is his first book here, All the Ordinariness, and it came out last year. Tony, I've been friends with since many 20 years ago um, or so. Is that true? 21, Jesus. Um, and we met here in poetry school. And um, being back here, I remember all these things. I'm like, we drank there. He was a janitor there. I stomped on roaches with him over there. Um, but uh, a great poet. I'm very excited about this book. Tony busts up and builds back language to explore the tragic injustice of imagination. The imagined self you carry in your head and then the one that spills out in front of others. The imagined possible world and then the one we wake up in every day. Tony grounds us in the gore of a fractured civilization with feverish lists. Here this bag of stone, here a cricket saw, a claw from a crayfish. It's the way we might list five things we see, four we hear, three we feel to fend off an anxiety attack. He upends notions we abide through habit, kettle calling the pot back, the yaz in every song, and copes with the chaos that creates by summoning new words. His book is filled with new, wonderful words. I admire his honest voice, both in real life and in his work. Um, his acknowledgement of a certain depressed resignation. Um, and I'm awestruck by the way he always writes us back into finding delight in the world. And that he does too, personally and in his work. Um, so, the real bio part. Tony's the author of a handful of chapbooks, including Apologetics, Apologies, By Sea, Diplomacy, and City Country. And this is his first full-length collection. He's an instructional designer and the chapbook editor for Barrel House. And he lives in Colorado with uh, beautiful Shannon and beautiful Sebastian. And welcome, Tony. Hi, everybody. Um, and thanks, Summer, for doing that. And thank you. Charles and Pog for having us here. It's really lovely to be back. Um, and I'll, after I read, do a quick and terrible introduction for, for Aaron. But uh, <laughs> read from, from the book and then some, some newer stuff. Uh, decided to choose the beginning and ending of each section. It's three sections in the book. Um, I'm bad at describing what I do, so I'll just read. And, you guys can judge me later. Um, all right. So the first section is titled uh, After Echo. Words, they never do the hearing, them old and pluck light things. Something wheeled and weld from another ago, another slip form, another clip shop filled wobbly and infantile, goosey letters, strained gaze, dry eyed and picked over. Repeat, Reaper, repeat, restrain. I take the time back to wear a reference dappled in chop light. They tickle the thoughts we can't capture any stop, no how. One corners the scent they meant to carry and tasks it with changing, but there's a beautiful rock to embed in each of our chests. The swill and swallowed pills start out encapsulated. Sponges inside them take shape, growing into recognizable forms, eventually taking a body whole down in form and function. Chambering oneself into silence, like a stone fruit, right down the crease to its hardened seed pit. The nail and tooth, numbness, their nubs, a division indeterminate. Who is busy being buried together in this space? with similar hopes stapled to their chests. What hands will grow unscathed, flies, and other elements played out in degrees relative to their worth? Regardless, 
we comply, drone-like, in our sounds and bones. The operators above pull the cord to reality and the silence that comes after will all eventually hold somehow. Money, clang, sound, made of wood, I push the key into so many creaks as if hemmed into the fold of a body through time disposed of its transforming, rusted to a crisp, spun again down some throat like we want. Um, the next couple of pieces are the front and back of the section called Heartbroker. Uh, and it's a little bit like uh, prosier, I guess. I'm not sick with emotion, it's just what drowns in me as a question. When the chairs are on fire and the memory of a lake settles its choppy water, you can enter the scene like someone from a different history. All the blades dull and drawered, you melt the candle down around the light it spits. Maybe another patch of sky like a bruise, the flat edge raising up to show. You take the pieces and put them in your mouth when it's evening. I'm certain that there's something about leaving a place that makes it difficult to see. We don't know how to bend toward or other ways that could be considered natural. If the sequence of events were around us, I'm going to leave this body here for later. You are going to assemble the forest from its echoes. One way to build a haunt, pick up the left things and ask them to talk. One parts and replaces, a dream becomes a nuisance after you form your heartstone, after it cracks like an egg against your pursuit, the wall of it, the wailing, the hide thick afterwards, how you cut back to love like a question. Three knives you can shoot, a whole channel devoted to this. Alternatives included, whisper them to me, how they fork and branch. Distance makes the heart, they say, molds it flat and onto your shirt, clay or stone or magic marker. You pick the person, but not the time. You place the map and find yourself, maybe. I draft the papers up. I ask them to say their sayings back to us. Fan blades move the air. When it's time to say goodbye, that feeling like a stave, right through. Say something loving. Say the word something, like you really mean it. Whatever's inside you will burn, and then it'll be gone. People are places we know. They can be found folded in the clothes, floating on water, trusting that any word well meant could set them free, could set them fire. To generate heat, one must cause friction or simply remain. I'm taking my things. I'm always naming the Saturdays in midweek, and I'm sticking my plates together, taking my things away from you. I will never scatter. Skirt the meaning making. If you loved so much the thing beating you, it became a stone, semi-precious. You would say there was something to trade, the economy of balance, a new suture to compress, but the licked after scar will be a story to sell the friend group to placate the children with when they've finally buckled themselves into sleeping positions. If you beat the sellers at their game, the stone and you reanimated, take it to its beginning. Now go in before that space and pull out your hand blood. The print is what's left of the cave wall, a fire sooting the roof. The threat you open with is a body. Say your name aloud. One room for everything possessed and the certainty that comes from knowing how to lose. Wind begs its runs forward and the trees turn their pages. Thistle in the hollows beneath your chest, as if a hill was once and always a hill, but we know better where to begin the burying. Say your curtain call and the sparrows knit a shadow into the sky, if you remain, if you leave. I can't discern the difference between us. I'm not speaking metaphorically here. This is a screen and we are habiting it. We are inside the marks. I don't know where to better something the thought of you clots. Hey, boom. Crossing out now, um, there's yeah, two small pieces from this, and then I'm going to jump into something else entirely. Um, if you cut the characters into cute squares, if you take them down and down again into the halo, the sun belching, shit stains on the carpet, and the children in their know-nothingness blearily joyed. Among the buildings and their sutures, it is hard to sing sometimes. 
with all the forest rattling your thoroughfares with all the holes in your throat. And how a body folds billows like into itself when tensing for the form tomorrow takes. We are busy with keys and with whatever they don't fit into, jangling our feet as they suck into the earth, get pulled up by the roots. But put one metal above all others, the same as one animal above the fold of the firmament, the field, I meant, filed above it and looking down, to tame this animal. The body bends into its bruises and whatever else it has to, straining against the hardness of reality and what each current moment contains. All time is, is framing forms or reining them in. If you cut the cords into slip and shadow and ask then to pull them taut, whatever you trap will not be truly caught. The root is growing, the body is asked for in a question, and that is the opposite of what we find before us, which is the truth drugged out and dragged through all its glory, rag and bone shopping in the Western Hemisphere, our cards maxed up to their ideas, and past this, imagine the water line where the water keeps climbing. The dilemma is there is no reassurance we can either and or our way out through this whole cut. Um, the next series of things is much more recent. Um, and Sebastian, who is I think in the bathroom now, figures into this a bit, but uh, it's, it's from a sort of like longer serial thing. It's called Wayward and Collapse, My Heart is No Place. Um, and the first, it's, it sort of alternates titles between sections. So, Wayward and Collapse. I'm waiting for a file forever to upload. How many shards of glass after the tumbler shatters? The year is just so. People I wish would love me were never alive. And this pinhead of blood on the child's finger is only a measure for the cotton ball to call its own. My heart is no place. Asleep on the seat after thrashing to find some comfort in a blue blanket folded over the armrest. His body slightly bigger than the seat, he walks to the window, asks, what's on the back of the plane? I say tail, say a possum, and the window holds his hand the hours we've inhabited between spaces. Wayward and collapse. The boy stands up in the dark, shouts, have you ever met a goggy? Two minutes later, he promptly falls asleep. And we f keep ourselves quiet as we can as life bakes us into minutes and days, the blinking endlessness of it all, a few mouthfuls of nonsense and bliss. My heart is no place. The dead bird on the roof looks first like an owl, then turns out to be a young red-tailed hawk I'm not sure what we can prevent. Its head contorted, the down above its tail, the only thing still moving slight in the air. Wayward and collapse. The boy wakes to indecision and thrashes his form forward, eye first into the metal frame of the sleeper sofa. How are you today? No, how are you today? A string of asking this with inflection that rises on you and day. I'm not sure what sounds to freak out about. It's snowing here, or about to snow. My phone buzzes when it's empty. The mountains are at 60%, and the fields remind me of being youngish, indented cars with cigarettes, and we were busy learning how not to care enough about anything. My heart is no place. This isn't a diary, it is a day, a practice, and our deaths all make us the same. Wayward and collapse. Wait now more for some planks of lighted fur. The boy presses his whole form into the yay bright powder, questions where the London Bridge is falling and suggests the, liver, the driver look it up. A hat with mountains and two hands made out of coal. We skip water and cleaning. What image rhymes with tree? A dozen more months before a different future sets the horizon free. My heart is no place. 
I watched my son shout, excuse me, in a restaurant to stop us from talking. The times are constant in their dismay. It's the part of the year where we go asking the day to get on with its growing. Wayward and collapse. Comb bumblebees into a distressed rhododendron with your messy fist. I count half of the kids' shoves as a well. Pull the bucket up by turns and trust a canyon to yell across can't be filled. So it's easy enough to become everywhere. I put thistle, this letter, a whistle inside the ring. White noise written into the head plate. A chest full of buzzing that never quite booms. My heart is no place. The boy sleeps and wakes and says he doesn't like volcano sound. Words in his mouth that weren't there before to think his thoughts and fear. I thank him. And he says, you're welcome. Test inflection and thanks you're welcome's breakfast. I wake up challenged by being alive and sleep and say I love you so much knowing whatever is here will also not be. Wayward and collapse. The way you press a bird into your hand to learn what flying means. You place a feeling in shadow. How light skips across water. What follows a body to field. Think now and then now against some other time. Again, any color you can't name. My heart is no place. If you give a dragon a flagon of ale, if you give a bear a bonanza, if you give a donkey a didgeridoo, if you give a shark a saltine, if you give a horse a hand grenade, if you give a porcupine a, kind, a pine cone, the boy says what will happen every instance is Play-Doh. We fail to recognize that providing animals with so many things would have the same outcome. So he stepped into stop traffic and yelled at the sky. Thanks. This is Aaron's book. It's called The, the Fact of Memory. It's out from uh, Rose Metal Press, which does wonderful stuff. And this is a wonderful book. Um, Aaron Angelo is one part cloud, two parts stage, uh, one and a half parts fabrication, a half part thoughts and cars mixed with a pile of constraints. <laughs> Um, and he, let me see, yeah, he's a poet, playwright, uh, I, I think I saw that you're a stunt, yeah. stunt man, yeah, uh, an essayist from the Rocky Mountains who lives in, feels remarkably out of place in Frederick, Maryland currently. Uh, he received his MFA and PhD from the University of Colorado in Boulder and he currently, or will be again, teaching at Hood College in the fall. Um, please welcome uh, Aaron Angel. So I'll tell you a little bit about what this this book is while I'm doing this. Um, uh, so so each title of each piece in this book is a word from Shakespeare's 29th Sonnet um, in order. It was sort of a daily practice um, uh, where I just wrote, you know, I fill up a page with um, whatever came to mind based on that word. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it became what it is. But, um, so I, I'm going to read from that today. Um, the sonnet is one that I just had. It's just, I don't know why I was actually uh, drawn to it in the first place. Um, other than the fact that I memorized it when I was a kid. I'm not as tall as Tony. There we go. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, and I, just, I kind of love it. It's, so it's kind of silly, like Shakespeare's sonnets all are, many are. Um, but it's if you buy into it, <laughs> if you buy into the sentiment, then it's really profound. I think uh, it's a uh, win in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes. I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, I came with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet, 
in these thoughts, myself almost despising. Haply I think on thee, and then my state, like to a lark at break of day rising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Um, okay. oh, no, no, don't do that. Um, so uh, what I need you to do is yell out, um, this is like a kind of, I, I don't know why I read the book this way because they're not all equally good um, in my mind, but you just pick any word that you see on that page and yell it out and I will read that piece. Contented. Contented. I still, like, you know, I know the sonnet, obviously, but I don't know where the words come. I have to look at the uh, thing. To look at the table of contents. 62, okay. Contented. Uh, Jean Clement, a French super centenar supercentenarian, was born in Arles, France, 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 in 1875, and she died 122 years later in 1997. When she was 13, she met Vincent Van Gogh when she came into her father's store to buy a canvas, when he came into the father's store to buy a canvas. She was physically active. She took up fencing at 85, rode her bike until she was 100, then continued to walk everywhere until a surgery at 110. But she wasn't particularly athletic. She smoked cigarettes until she was 117, and she ate more than two pounds of chocolate a week. She never stopped drinking port wine. She outlived her grandchildren by decades. When she died, everyone on the planet took two steps to their left. The stock market dropped suddenly, and three men in their 40s slipped into cardiac arrest. 79 women had their first orgasm, and thousands of women had no orgasm at all. There was a burst of static on the radio right in the middle of a new Radiohead track. A small group of college students studied for a chemistry exam. Three people received their pilot's license. Millions were asleep, and they all dreamed a dream in which fresh vegetables figured prominently. There were 163 people on Mount Everest. 46 people moved to Los Angeles to try acting. An eight-year-old boy finally stood up to a bully at school, punching him squarely in the nose. I played a cover of Bob Dylan's Make You Feel My Love on the patio of a cafe on Melrose. <laughs> Thank you. Gate. Gate. Uh, Ninety-six. This is good. These are ones that people don't often call out, so it's fun for me. I have no idea what it's going to be. Uh, a neglected sidewalk, grass growing through cracks, runs parallel to an untraveled street. There's a wrought iron fence between the sidewalk and an empty lot. The lot is cluttered with discarded household objects. Empty tur turpentine cans, clothes hangers, a coat rack, an old refrigerator, a cracked red hot water bottle. In the back corner, there's a weather-beaten broken piano, its keyboard entirely intact, but its hammers striking on the air. A boy lies on his back in the middle of, his, of the lot, his arms outstretched, extended, handfuls of weeds in his fist. He is singing a made-up song, made-up words, made-up tune, a siren in the distance. The gate on the fence creaks and the boy looks up. No one is there. A car rolls by, a single jet with a long, undisturbed contrail. The boy singing. Somewhere else, people play football and grill hot dogs. There is a network server, a sculptor in her studio, a boxer hitting a speed bag, a man scribbling into a notebook, a cat watching birds through a window, a newborn baby, a reporter drinking coffee at an unremarkable cafe in an Istanbul ne neighborhood that is popular with young people, is about to be abducted by a militant group. A farmer sits in his truck outside of a Wells Fargo in Des Moines. A teenager gets her period in the middle of class. A wedding is called off. A group of actors rehearse the mechanical scene in A Midsummer Night's Dream. A woman spoons pureed vegetables into her mouth. A social media app is updated. A flock of pigeons peck at paving stones around a courtyard fountain. The boy stretches his arms and legs, sings, makes snow angels in the dead grass. Outcast. Outcast. Little circles around everybody. 
The first circle is not really a circle at all, but it's the border that traces the points at which the skin meets air. This is my body. It belongs to me. It is unique and separate from all that surrounds it. This circle, or border, is at the center of a slightly larger circle or border. Uh, this one is different for everyone. It's sometimes called one's personal space. It's the area within which a person can literally feel on the surface of their skin the resonant presence of another body. When another body enters this space uninvited, it is violation. When a body enters it invited, it is eroticism. For some, this space is an inch or two around the first circle. For others, it can be several feet. This is our body, our personal space. Our skin feels even without touch. We forget, though, that our bodies continue to extend outward, out from the chair in which we sit, out across the room, through the books and furniture and walls, out along the streets and through buildings, across the countryside into eternity. Despising. Uh, the other day, I read a short news item on the internet. It was about a man who threw his daughter off of a cliff because he didn't want to pay child support any longer. This and stories like it, horrible though they most certainly are, also serve as kinds of parables. Parables of the corrupting influences of power, the frailty of mind, the flawed, flawed bonds of love that exist between us. At the same time, a story like this because of how extreme it is, provides us an out, convinces us that although we may be subject to the corrupting influences of power, although we may occasionally act a little crazy, although the love we feel for each other fades and breaks, so often lovers become strangers or enemies, although all of that is true, we tell ourselves that we could never reach the level of depravity to which this man, sank, this man in the story sank. Uh, stories like this exonerate us from responsibility, from culpability, from complicity with all the terrible things in the world. A woman in Georgia drowns her children in the bathtub. She wants to keep them pure, innocent. She wants to free them from evil, from the corrupting influences that await them in this God-forsaken world. She knows that her children are good, are innocent, and they will go straight to heaven. When we read the story, we pray for her children. We pray for her. We pray for ourselves. Desiring. Desiring this man's art. Where's that? Oh, there's 49. There you go. Desiring. Uh, there's an engine beneath everything, always churning and running. It's funny, it's like you guys are picking all of the, the like, I was, I was writing some of this when I was writing a dissertation, so a lot of it is this nerdy stuff. Anyway, um, there's an engine beneath everything, always churning and rumbling. We call it desire, but it's sometimes called will or something else. Desire propels transformation. And it's a Heracletian constant. Sure, it can be thought of in the more common way, desire for, some, for something. I desire a beautiful woman, for example, and I alter my behavior, which in a sense alters my being until I possess her. If I ever manage to obtain the object of my desire, then I no, no longer desire that object. This is basic stuff that we all know. But the thing about this kind of desire is after we've obtained the desired object, we desire something else. Thus, we continue to change. But desire is not always conscious, and it is not always human. It is the force that actualizes potential in the world. Uh, objects and events in the world are the imminent actualization of potential through desire. A beetle is contextualized within a field of switchgrass. A cloud becomes a flood. A building shadow articulates a crowd of people walking to work. Every subtle diversion, every concoction of thought, every television commercial is desire manifest. The pain in the child's leg that keeps him awake at night becomes a terracotta pot filled with a thriving bushel of basil on the windowsill of a din uh, dingy apartment. A film from 1963 about a French woman who likes to dress in men's clothing and paint a mustache on her upper lip with eyeliner becomes a plate of deviled eggs. Scope. 
three rocks are balanced on top of one another, stacked in a pillar on the side of a, of a creek, uh, stacked in a pillar on the side of a creek, evidence of another human hand. The, this provides the hiker who comes upon it with a bit of perspective, whether it was put there to mark a spot, a cairn to indicate a location on a path, or whether someone just did it because they wanted to see a stack of rocks by a creek, it doesn't matter now. Now the, stack of, now the stack of rocks is only communicating the fact that there was another person in this place and that person altered the environment. That person created something in the world and the world will never be the same again. I have the lyrics to so many songs in my head. I wonder sometimes if all my speech, everything I say or have ever said is a quote from some song. Maybe it's slightly remixed, but the source material for every utterance I make is a vast bank of song lyrics, mostly from the 80s and 90s. Every promise I've made is made of pop song, a visitation subject to context. In the 30s, Alan Lomax traveled across the country with recording equipment, capturing and collecting songs. He went to prisons, uh, remote parts of Appalachia, Georgia plantations, anywhere he could find someone sitting on a front porch with a banjo, singing a song that had been passed down from generation to generation, anywhere that he could find a song to collect. Voices scratchy and old, singing songs with words that were nearly lost, words pronounced with strange accents, stacked precariously on the precipice of forgetting. Maybe I'll do one more, and then we'll bring up the star. Eyes. Eyes? I can't believe my eyes, some would say with a kind of unambiguous wisdom, a note of sadness in their voices. The voices of those who have eaten the fruit of the forbidden tree, who are aware of their nakedness, who wander through the desert on cracked and dusty feet. These organs, these eyes, are always there, in the face, looking forward. The look are often unaware of their presence and functioning. This is part of the problem. I remember a movie I saw as a child. The characters were all puppets, but they were puppets representing fantastical and often frightening creatures. One of the puppets was a witch, I believe, who held an eye up above her head in her hand. Uh, it was through this eye that she saw, for she had none in her face. If she found it necessary to see something or someone or something, she would take her eye, her tool, out of her pocket or pouch and point it in the direction of a particular set of data that she might actually apply to various other sets of data that she had collected by other means and stored in her, her cackling little puppet brain. Uh, we might all be better off with eyes in pouches. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And Summer Browning is a poet, writer, curator, artist. Uh, her latest book, Good Actors, um, that's the book uh, out of which she made the play. Um, uh, it came, came out from Birds. Uh, just recently. She's the author of two other collections of poetry, Backup Singers and Either Way I'm Celebrating, as well as an artist book, The Circle Book, um, The Joke Book, You're On My Period, and others. Um, in 2017, she founded Georgia, the art space I was just referring to, um, in Denver. She is also a performer. This is the, I'm, I'm reading this from the bio for the play, so now that this is like the, the performance heavy bio, but um, I'll skip that, you guys. Uh, her poetry, <laughs> art writing, and visual art have appeared in uh, Hyperallergic Lit Hub, Bomb, Jubilat, Chicago Review, The American Poetry Review, and all over the place. She's a librarian in Denver, Colorado, and um, a graduate of the University of Arizona. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Pog for throwing this together, and to Tim, is it, for this wonderful space. Thank you. Um, Let's see. When Andy Warhol, famous artist, was on the love boat. For a few seconds during the opening credits, the famous artist's face appears inside a stylized blue wave. He's wearing a tux like all the other male stars in the episode. Andy Griffith, Milton Berle, Raymond St. Jacques, He's last in the credits because his name begins with W. Long ago, his name ended in A, but he dropped it. No one seems to know where the A went. The famous artist's storyline in this episode is called 
picture from the past. In all the most famous pictures of him, he looks like he is pretending to be a person. All the mannerisms of a person are there, and the accoutrement, hair, suit, shoes, a face. Beyond the fact that there is a face, though, what? It's unreadable. In fact, it is aggressively empty. People have said it is boredom or shyness, aloofness or smugness, but it is the thing in the middle of all that, the or. When we remember the 80s, we are encouraged to remember the people who are plastic, overacting parodies of themselves. Mr. T, Gaddafi, Cher, Margaret Thatcher, the famous artist's diffidence parodies the parody. The famous artist is merely himself. Maybe he flicks the tiniest smile or maybe his lips just twitched. I would rather watch somebody buy their underwear than read a book they wrote. See how even his sentences sound like parodies? The famous artist boards the MS Pacific Princess with an entourage bedecked with the most stereotypical of 80s fashions. A pair of headphones, a bolero hat, a tight, shiny mini dress. The famous artist is here to celebrate the ship's 200th voyage. He is to pick a lucky woman passenger and paint her picture. His entourage includes the actor Raymond St. Jacques, whose character is unnamed, and two waif-like women named Spock and BFD, played by Laura Dean and Vera Perez. The women's characters have names, yet are never referred to, nor do they speak. But they wave, which seems important. They all wave from the balcony of the ship, smiling as it shoves off to Cabo. The famous artist waves with his right hand like a baby learning goodbye. The fact that the famous artist appears on an episode of The Love Boat isn't special. The famous artist shows up in dozens of movies and television shows. Sometimes he plays himself, sometimes he doesn't. The actor Carrie Elways plays him in the, 19, in the 2018 film Billionaire Boys Club. Funnily enough, in this movie, the famous artist is in town filming the Love Boat episode. As he dines with Kevin Spacey, they gossip about this, his episode's co-star, Milton Berle's huge penis. The scene is smarmy, oily, predatory, awkward. When you watch it, you cringe, and then whatever cringed in you, cringes. In I Shot Andy Warhol, Jared Harris plays the famous artist, but is too sweet. In Factory Girl, Guy Pierce plays the famous artist, but is too handsome. In Basquiat, David Bowie plays the famous artist, but is too schnabel. In The Doors, Crispin Glover plays the famous artist, but is too generous. In Men in Black 3, Bill Hader plays the famous artist, but is too silly. In Watchmen, Greg Travis plays the famous artist, but is merely a prop. In Death Becomes Her, Bob Swain plays the famous artist, but his bangs are too long. In the 80s, my sister and I were sometimes invited to swim in our neighbor's grandmother Noreen's swimming pool in Brentwood. Once at Noreen's, the actor Judd Nelson was in the mansion next door filming the miniseries The Billionaire Boys Club. He was the star. He was playing the main character, Joe Hunt. We barely knew who Nelson was, but what we knew most was that he was well known. My sister and I take a photo with him. We hug him. I cannot remember what we look like in the photo. The photo is lost. Are we smiling? I remember feeling so shy that I wished I was anyone else, or maybe no one. The famous artist is poolside. He is photographing subjects randomly, it seems. But it is not random at all. He's guided by that artistic aesthetic, that elite thing that cannot be questioned, a knowledge of what is beautiful that approaches divinity off limits to all but a few. The famous artist sees something in you, something you knew you had, 
something you knew had always been there, something waiting to be discovered. The famous artist sees what you want to stop hiding. The ship's bartender, Isaac, desires to be seen. He suggests the famous artist paint his portrait. He puts his arm around the famous artist, but St. Jacques gently removes it as if to say, don't touch the merchandise. But St. Jacques has it wrong. The merchandise is Isaac's desire. In many movies, photographs, and books, the famous artist spends a lot of time on the telephone. In the doors, Chris, Crispin Glover holds a golden telephone. He tells Val Kilmer, playing Jim Morrison, that God is on the other end of the line. The famous artist admits he has nothing to say to God and hands it over to Jim. Perhaps someone else would have something boring enough to tell God. The famous artist is on the phone with his friend Viva when two bullets ricochet around his ribcage. The famous artist almost dies on the phone. The ship's photographer Ace has slipped the famous artist some of his own photographs. He confronts St. Jacques. Ace, did the famous artist see my photos? St. Jacques, yes, he called them the essence of crass commercialism. Ace, oh, he didn't like them. St. Jacques, on the contrary, the famous artist says crass, crass commercialism is what makes America great. The great American laugh track laughs. One cannot just speak to the famous artist directly. Talking to the famous artist requires playing that old familiar game telephone. It is a lot like playing, praying to God through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. By the time your prayer gets to God, who knows what the hell you're asking for. Near the end of the episode, one of the characters calls the famous artist a New York flake ball. In this context, New York means pretentious and flake ball means gay, words being the best actors of all. The more famous you are, the more important the things you hide become. The famous artist compulsively wore wigs, even wigs of various lengths to, to pretend he got his hair cut. In 2020, three of them were under glass at the Tate Modern. Surely from the Pancake House, where I used to host, just wore wigs too. I'm sure they're in a landfill at this point. Like in real life, the famous artist spends much of the episode lurking in the background taking photos. We see him do this near the pool and on the deck. Famously, the famous artist centers himself by not centering himself. The famous artist's absence is doubled when he is flanked by thin, beautiful women, gay people, people of color, and other things the great American audience finds extraordinary. All these people cement his presence. At one point, the famous artist stops to sign autographs for the great American cruise ship passengers. The most famous artist on earth is playing himself on TV, pretending to sign his name with a fake Hollywood pen for people pretending to adore him. And if you are all still with me, are you? We're thinking about it 37 years later. Is anything ever really happening? Viva is the famous artist's close friend. She is a friend that didn't overdose at 28, get run over by a car at 38, die of complications related to AIDS at 62 or 52 or 56, or diabetes at 59, overdose at 38, die of cancer caused by carcinogenic hormone treatments at 29, die from cancer at 78 or 69, die from either a hit and run or a heroin overdose at 29, jump out of a window at 24, die of a brain tumor at 50, jump out of a window at 28, die from either a seizure or a drug overdose at 45 or 46, die from falling off a bicycle at 49, disappear off the face of the earth at 42, die of a stroke at 78, or heart failure at 68, like his other friends. No one knows if the famous artist really loved anyone. No one can really agree on a definition of love anyway. Don't you love that? 
the famous artist might say. Don't you love that no one knows what love is? Don't you love that no one knows what love is? But they say they just love, love, love things all day long. Thank you so much.